Today's Keeper is presented by Hosts at Home with support from subscribers like you. All these people want to know where in the world is Carmen San Diego? San Diego. Hello again, Gumshoes. I'm Adam Wurzel. Welcome to a very special edition of Hosts at Home. Now, we knew for our upcoming second season that we wanted to interview Greg Lee, the host of several of your favorite shows, but today is truly special because for the first time since 1995, we are reuniting the cast of the hit PBS game show, Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? That's right, with us, Acme Senior Agent in Charge of Training New Recruits, Greg Lee, also the gentleman, of course, the gentleman who performed as the house band on the show. They're all here too. Sean Altman, Scott Leonard, Elliot Kerman, Barry Carl, and Jeff Thatcher, better known as Rockapella. Of course, the Rockapella incarnation of the early to mid 90s. Gentlemen, great to see all of you. Great to see you. You too. Great to see you, Adam. Yeah. So we always start each episode of Hosts at Home by asking, where is home for you? Greg, we'll start with you. Uh, these days, it's in Santa Monica, California. Sean? I live in Manhattan with my wife and my daughter. How about you, Scott? I live in New York City, but I'm, I've escaped to Florida at the moment. How about you, Jeff? I live in Denver for two years now, but I used to live in New York City. I'm probably coming back. Ooh. Ooh. Dude. East. East. <laughs> east. east. <laughs> How about Whoa. you, Barry? I'm about 20 miles north of Manhattan in farm country. Oh. <laughs> Elliot? I'm also in Manhattan still. Can I just say, Elliot, I, I love the hat. The hat is fantastic. Thank you. It was a, it was a Carmen throw, throwback. Oh, very good. I love it. Uh, Greg, let's start with you. You were working at a very iconic place for other kids game shows when you got the job on Carmen. Tell everybody about that and how you transitioned into this role as host of Carmen San Diego. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I did a lot of stuff for Nickelodeon. I started off as a um, audience warm-up guy for, for a lot of their stuff. Uh, there was an old, old show called on CBS Saturday morning. That's how long ago this was. It was called um, Dr. Fad, which is about kids and uh, inventions, I guess it was. So I was doing a lot of audience warm-up and then some uh, announcing stuff and then it was just a regular you know audition for for Carmen I'd been down in, in Florida doing some more Nickelodeon stuff down there for, for a total panic and then came back to New York and then yeah we just had the audition with the with Carmen so we started there how involved were you in the development of the show not much they, they already had, had it pretty much going when I got there you know uh try not to screw it up too bad I remember my stuff say the say the big words <laughs> Elliot, Elliot, let's go over to you now. Can you tell us a little bit more about the group's audition process for the show? Um, God, I don't know if I even remember that. I think I can't remember what happened. I think they, does anybody remember actually? I do remember. I remember at least how we got the audition. So we had just, um, Spike Lee and company do it acapella had aired and that was our first national prominence. And sometime after that aired, I remember being in my closet in my, uh, on East 10th street in my apartment and the phone rang and it was, it was way pre cell phone and I answered it and he said, my name is Dana Calderwood and I'm directing a, um, a show in development about uh, that's based on a on a on a um, on a popular kids computer game, and we saw you guys on Spike Lee, and would you be interested in auditioning for the role of the house fan? That I remember. After that, I don't remember much at all. <laughs> Let's talk to you, Scott, because Scott, you joined Rockapella in 1991, the same year as Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, San Diego premiered. Can you kind of just? Go in depth a little bit about how crazy life was for you in 1991. It was crazy. I just got back from work uh, in Japan and wanted to move to New York. And uh, there was something in the backstage publication about various things. But one of the things is Rockefeller. It sounded like a good fit. So 
I went up and sang with them and we decided to do it. And then my first, then to actually move up to New York, I think the, I moved up the first, the day before we had a meeting with the producers of Carmen San Diego. So as soon as I got there, we started doing that. And then a bunch of stuff hit, like we did a Whoopi Goldberg HBO special and a Taco Bell commercial for the MTV Movie Awards. And then we, and then Billy Joel. And it's all been downhill for 30 years since. <laughs> Yeah, really, I thought it was really going to be great. <laughs> hoping to get back there. Uh, Sean, let's let's chat with you because we can't move forward without talking about this iconic theme song. How did you get the idea for the theme song of the show? Um, I would I would I wish there was a uh, I had an erudite explanation, but I really think it was a weird beginner's luck because I wasn't a. And now I consider myself a songwriter, but when I wrote that, I, I, I think I, I considered myself someone who had an ear for, for something catchy, but I, I think I, I kind of got lucky and it was, um, you know, they, they, they told us they, they wanted music and, and I had this idea for the, for the thing. Somewhere on a micro cassette, I have like the, the, the recording of me calling it calling into my answering machine because that was before there was uh, smartphones where you could record an idea and um, you know the, the the most seasoned songwriter I knew was my old high school friend David Yazbek and I said I've got a, I've got three ideas what do, is any of these any good and he said this one is the good one and I said would you would you help me flesh it out and he did and uh and we did a demo and the group liked it. And next thing you know, it, it was on TV. And we, we never had any concept that it would be featured in the way that it was. That was really unusual. And I think that's pretty much explains why the song has a, a, a lasting impact is that we were on camera singing it or lip syncing it every day. What, you know, what kind of, what theme song gets that kind of placement uh, anymore so that was it was a weird confluence of happy accidents and luck rockapella was featured prominently throughout all five seasons of where in the world is carmen san diego barry you guys did these song clues throughout the show a, a lot of times these clues were arrangements that Rockapella had already done live with new lyrics. How quickly did you have to learn all of this material? The group was just, um, it was kind of mind blowing to sit in a dressing room and without a keyboard or anything, throw together arrangements of songs and then go on, on the set and record them. Uh, I, I felt like I was, I was working with a bunch of like Mozart level geniuses because they, <laughs> We, we figured out parts and jammed, you know, they'd write these lyrics and we'd, we'd jam them into songs. And we were kind of used to doing that anyway with, with uh, industrial shows, you know, taking songs from our repertoire and putting somebody else's lyrics to them. But uh, now when I, when I look back and, I, and I, uh, I'll, I'll watch one of those clues, I'll go, damn, that was tight. For our next clue, here's Rockapella. Sit skating as you sing your love She's singing out the whisper Fifteen minutes ago we put this together and went out and, and did it. It was just it was an amazing process. Does anybody remember did we even use cue cards? Because I, I don't recall. Sometimes. Okay. But also what was crazy was that I think in the first three seasons, we did them live. It wasn't until the latter, maybe the fourth and the fifth season that they started taping our clues. So we would, we would literally have to put together an arrangement, do the arrangement, learn the thing, and then go out and sing it live during the show. Wait a minute, something's going on out here. Let's find out what it is. Hey guys, what's up? 
Calypso! One, two, three, four! Back to back! Ha 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 ha! Ha ha It was a zombie jamboree Took place in an island cemetery It was a zombie jamboree On an island in the Caribbean Sea Just south of the Windward Islands You can hear some great Calypso bands Zombies of the season of Carnival Oh, they get together in Bacchanal First year, they would do the whole show straight through like that they started splitting it up that's great, where you that's do great. all the middle game or all the end games right that first was like a radio show it was crazy it was horrible. <laughs> yeah. horrible we were there very late at night too oh, right. very, very early very early in the morning, <laughs> so very late i didn't see spring for five years <laughs> and you guys you guys may not have known that you, you remember that they that first Several shows they kept changing the rules. Did you were you aware of that? Even it continued to change as we were going. The scoring system on today's Carmen San Diego is different, but the game is the same. That's not happening now. We're going to do this, and it was just so horrible. You were really good though by the seat of your pants. Yeah. Like, you really <laughs> I think I was just dazed. It's very kind of I think it was out of my mind. Well, you look cool. <laughs> It's the code, baby. It's the code. <laughs> and this is special agent in charge of training new recruits, Greg Lee. Greg Lee. Greg Lee. Greg Lee. Yeah, everybody. Seriously, that first year was was a lot of reinventing the wheel as we were going, and I still have some parents who were mad at me from the first season because <laughs> if you guys remember. <laughs> We would get, as Scott said, we would do the whole thing, or, or, or Elliot said, we would do the whole thing all the way through. So you would do all of the business with you guys and the songs. You were doing those live, and I would go to Lynn's office, and she'd be sitting back there. We'd do our bit. We'd come back out. We'd keep rolling. We'd go right into the middle part, into the, into the big map part. And the, the rules of the big map for the first season, at least for most of it, was I had to give three clues for each country. So while the kid's staying in there with the scent, <laughs> let me tell a little bit about this particular country. <laughs> in the iron ore, and it's so very tepid. It's going, the kids are like, just tell me the name of the country, man. On your mark, get set, go. <laughs> Side of landmark civil rights protest as capital is Montgomery. Carmen went to Alabama. <laughs> All right, sorry, try it again. That's it, okay. So come on, let's go. The nation's leading dairy, dairy producer at Capitals Madison. Carmen went to Wisconsin. Rattling off all this information. Parents are mad. I can see him off to the side. They're screaming. Why is he reading so slow? <laughs> so, that got changed relatively early. But, but I don't remember any pilots, but I do remember just, as they said, a lot of, you know, the beginning time, just kind of making it up and staying very late and getting up very early. Um, but it was a, I, I got to tell you, man, it was still some of the best, Best friends I've ever had working ever. Met my wife on that show. And it was just one of the greatest experiences because I think it was more than a, you know, it was more than just a game show. I think it was, it was uh, a lot going on there. And um, I wish they still had something like it. Cause you know, I think one of the things we always said about that show was people would always ask, you know, uh, do you really think you can teach kids about geography in such a short period of time? We would always say, well, no but we can get them excited about it and interested in it because it's not just about the places on the map, you know, it's, you got people there and cultures and food and religion and all these wonderful traditions. And as we've seen the world get so much smaller, you know, it seems so much more important to be aware of that. And I, I kind of, uh, I'm sorry that they still don't have something like that. They can get, they can do that for, for kids and, and for us too. So. Hey, Greg, when, when did you, at some point I know you started writing for the show yeah and i was i remember being really happy because i felt like you were you know i, mean, I always felt like i was completely in the dark about anything having to do with the the inner workings of the show you know i, I feel like i did what i was told but um <laughs> at some point you started writing and that must have been very sort of freeing and uh, uh creatively exciting for you yeah it really was gr it really was fun you know because Working with you guys and, and of course with Lynn was just such a, I, I, always, I always felt very, because like I said, I, I'd basically come from audience warm up and announcing, so it was still kind of new to me to even do any of this kind of stuff. And uh, 
I always felt like I was, you know, learning so much from you guys and, and from Lynn too. Ah. And I remember when it dawned on me that she was hilarious. Like, I don't know that they really realized how hilarious she is. When I asked if I could just take a few shots at starting to write some stuff, you know, I started with those, what we call GLOs, the Greg and Lynn's office, you know. Yeah. And um, I said, I remember saying, uh, for a while there, my character kept taking all the hits. And I kept saying, I think my character is the kid and she's like the parent. And I'm telling you, she can't hit herself in the face with a boxing glove and fall back. And it will be funny because she's hilarious. And I just remember that just for a lot of the writers, it seemed like it opened a lot of possibilities because she was so great. And you guys were always so up for anything and, you know, and, 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 for whatever could happen. It just opened so many things that we get so fun. So I wasn't just the guy having to read those cards. Did you read, uh, did you write the Floyd the Barber stuff? Was yeah, the, Barber, yeah, the Floyd the Barber. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Floyd the Barber, which is basically my brother preacher character, which is basically my, uh, the mayor from Doug. It's all the same. No, no, nonsense. That burning sensation is normal. It's the, uh, well, it's the puffiness that has me concerned. Be back with you just a little bit. Hiya, Craig. Of course, there is one cast member, as Greg said, that is no longer with us. Jeff, tell us about your your memories of Lynn Thigpen. You know, Lynn, you know, she's a total professional. I've come to learn over the years how much she was respected. Uh, every show, she did a lot of shows, um, not just PBS goofy stuff, but really serious drama stuff. And there's just so much respect for her. And I, I'm sorry to, to not have her here. For our next clue, we... Hey, kids, you keep it down, guys. Keep it down, We're trying to catch some crooks. Trying to catch some crooks. Hey, come on, Greg, chill out now. Chill out now. They're going to tell us where to look. Where to look. She was a great singer, so we got to sing with. She did the number with and a few numbers with us, and when she would sing and tear it up, it was, it was really something. She won a Tony Award, and... Uh, she was the she played the stage manager in uh, the movie Tootsie. Yes. Oh my god! I mean, she's right. she's kind of you know she's <laughs> she's an icon and uh, such such a nice so nice to us. Just Sweet. just always really warm to us. She was lovely, a lovely, and she was very generous. She's a very lovely, generous person. She was a joy spreader, <laughs> and and it, I thought she just kind of up leveled the whole production she was she was probably the, the the one real pro amongst us no offense greg <laughs> <laughs> totally agree i was the hack that was the way yeah this is lynn thigpen speaking for where in the world is carmen san diego and remember criminals are mean and greedy but act means good like steve and edie they hired us to do uh, the, the next generation of Rockapella to do the Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego Planetarium show. You remember that, Scott? We, we, yeah. we, we, and we, it was like surround sound. It was supposed to be on a dome in a planetarium. It was after this, this show had ended. And I was so relieved to see that she was part of that because oh, yeah. we felt, to me, it seemed like a little bit adrift without her. And there she was comfortingly talking about planets and stars. Thank you for a ride on a slow ship to Pluto. Tell me where in the universe is Carmen San Diego. Oh, tell me where, where in the universe is Carmen San Diego. Where in the universe is Carmen San Diego. None of you guys have a Tony Award like Lynn did, but there was a lot of acting on this show. From the outside looking in, it kind of felt like Scott and Barry that you guys were doing most of the acting. Barry, we'll start with you. Did you come from an acting background? I did, but let's make a distinction here between acting like Lynn did <laughs> and shtick like we did. <laughs> well, I take offense at that. <laughs> what are you implying? The fine yeah. art of shtick. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Scott. For me, it wasn't. Dying it wasn't. That's Go fine. Ahead. <laughs> okay, it was deeply committed. Stanislavski method, really getting in there really penetrating the character. You know, I, I, had a, I had a long, passionate relationship with Mrs. Pumpkin Clanger. The stench of crime lies heavy upon us, like a patient etherized upon a table, and alas, 
My downstairs neighbors are the clumsy surgeon entrusted with its cure. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you still do the voice, Barry? Can you still do the Mrs. Pumpkin Clanger voice? Greggy! <laughs> no, I guess not. <laughs> um, Greggy! You know, the most interesting thing about that character was coming out of hair and makeup in, in my, my house dress and, and full drag, I had a bra and each cup was stuffed with two pairs of like thick athletic socks. And even though the camera crew, everybody knew me, you know, it's like, it was me. But there I was in, you know, a, a wig and makeup with these, with these huge tits. And I, the poor guys in the camera crew, they couldn't help looking at them. <laughs> I was like, guys, guys, it's socks. It's, it's me and socks. It's, uh, you're not looking at what you think you're looking at, but I know you can't help it. It's really funny. Uh, Scott, the Emmy, the Emmy for best dying informant goes, goes to you. <laughs> I think we have a serious problem on our hands. Do you ever lose your voice from all that screaming? I basically scream for a living. I mean, if you've listened to the parts in Rock of Poets. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever, well, I've lost my voice plenty, yeah, sure. But not from the dying informant. <laughs> With me, it wasn't really shtick, it was stick because I was such a wooden actor. Oh, uh, but, but, but we did, but it was, I guess, every, everybody's dream to put on an Elvis outfit, do Elvis. So that was actually really, really fun. That was one of my favorite moments of the whole show. That and consistently, actually, the middle game was absolutely phenomenally crazy on the edge of a cliff fun. Aruba's Fruit Market. Attention Fruit Mark shoppers, no. <laughs> Aruba's Fruit Market. Attention Fruit Mark shoppers, still no. <laughs> stampede. Stampede! That sounded like a real stampede. Caravan Town. Not, not here, here not, not now. now. <laughs> right, nothing there, turned around. Trying to get the warrant and the loot and like trying to crack Greg up. And like that whole thing was just crazy live TV. Shivani, <laughs> your turn. Gillette Castle. Gillette Castle. Ow! <laughs> Cut myself shaving, Greg. Get Why it? did you do that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> By the end, they would make us show them the list we had made of the terms for the loot because they got a little blue or a little bit too pushy, too edgy for PBS. So we would have to have Howard, the producer, come and look at our list, say, okay, okay. My favorite was when they had that statue in Belgium of the little guy that's urinating. Monkey piss. Monkey piss. And we said, little us, we, we. And, uh, and there was also a European. They, they vetoed that one. Uh, they vetoed European? Um, yeah, I was so disappointed. I thought, oh, European. Yeah. Okay. European. And it was like, no. <laughs> that would be totally allowed nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Bring on more pee. <laughs> we had the list of where everything was. And when they were, when they said something, we would all go into this, uh, like a sprinter's crouch, you know, and we were, you, you would hear the breathing of the guy next to you to know when to come in. It was, I was, it was, very, it was athletic and very exciting. The Warren, the loot and the warrant. Do you remember where Sarah is? Dinosaur State Park. Is she still at the Dinosaur State Park? Sarah! You That was like one of the most creative parts of the show is that we would actually get to write like five or six of them. And we were so, so frustrating when the kid would get it quickly and we didn't get to use <laughs> this on. brilliant comedy <laughs> writing. <Good stuff. laughs> I, think, I think we came up, I don't think we started with the loot. I think the loot came after they started 
um, censoring us. And so when they censored us, like with European and with, the, with those ones, then we would just be pissed and say, the loot. <laughs> <laughs> the diss. <laughs> uh, Jeff, when you, when you joined this group, I mean, what were your first thoughts? Because, I mean, these are some, some wild and zany people. Yeah, I had seen them on the Spike Lee special that they got Carmen from. And, and for my audition, I had to interpret the sequence drum sounds from the soundtrack album to Carmen San Diego. That was one of the things that Sean had me do in my hotel room audition. So when I got there, it was, you know, it was a well-oiled machine. It was already in uh, Queens in Kaufman Astoria Studios. And Elliot would pick me up in his car service in the Upper West Side of New York. And we would, off we would go to this crazy thing that I'd never seen before. I'd worked in production staff for TV for a couple of years, but I had not been a part of something this colorful and seemingly freewheeling, I guess you could say. And, and I, you know, that something that these guys have kind of alluded to, there was definitely a little bit of a rebellious vibe. There was a creative versus uh, structure kind of thing going on. That was really interesting to watch because that kind of sense of rebellion is kind of what Rockapella is in many ways. In my interpretation, I've seen that a lot and it's, and it's something that is hilarious. What's going to happen is Greg's going to come out and Scott's pants are down and Greg's going to come in. <laughs> the bright one. Yes! Go Dino, go, go, uh, word. Let's see if I can look in there. Oh, there you go. We'll have to use that one, I'm liking that. Uh, that's a good one, you can use that? Yes, let's do it. There's a fine set of, what do you call those things again? Uh, fiber optic sparklers. I knew how a TV show was made, but I had not seen that level of creativity in action, like moment to moment. It was really interesting. There was a lot of moving parts to this show. Greg, what was the most challenging part of your job? Well, I mean, I, I, I make jokes about it, but I really did, it, it was hard for me to read those cards. I mean, some of those names are very hard for me. I, I'm a fairly dyslexic person and I mean, seriously dyslexic. And so some of those were like, you gotta be kidding me, man. I couldn't even pronounce them or read them. Okay, guys, name the city, if you will, please. Is it Bratislava, Gdansk, or Odessa? Remember the clues that we heard on the Danube River. The answer we're looking for is Phnom Penh. Nice job, guys. Kunming, Hong Kong, or Taipei? Remember the clues that we heard. Thanks a lot. If there was ever any pressure about it, that, that for me was always the, the hardest part, to just be rolling and then have a Herzegovina sitting there at me. I have no idea what that said. <laughs> What in the world is that, you know? So that was always the hardest part for me. The rest of it was fairly, um, you know, when you could move and, and do things, it was fairly um, just enjoyable. It was just fun, you know? And um, of course the map was the most fun because just because I, that's the time that I felt like I was the kid's uh, teammate more than anything else. So you just really wanted them to get there. So. Do you think your geography skills got better through the years? Uh, possibly, I mean, um, I mean, they were okay before, I guess. Um, I remember the, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I think it was, was it the very first show? It was early on, I remember that uh, the Soviet Union broke up right before we went to tape one time. Mm -hmm. Do you guys remember this? Yes. We had to change all the maps like the night before. Yeah, and lyrics to someone new. Yeah. Check in Slovakia. Yeah, yeah. So everything had changed like the night before. So they'd been up all night changing the big map that we were going to use that day. And, uh, I don't know where that story has an ending somewhere, but I don't have it right now. <laughs> can, can we, I, I, while I have everybody here and I wanna kind of set the record straight because Barry, before we went on, told me a story, Greg, about this unique accident that happened on set between the two of you. Do, do you remember that, Greg? Who, who was it? What was the, who was Between the you and Barry, an accident happened. Between me and Barry? Barry knows it. Barry, you know it? Was it, it, it sounds did, like it an did. unplanned pregnancy. The 10 ton weight? <laughs> 10 ton weight? No, 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 but I still remember. Um, actually, we were, we were rehearsing one of, the, one of the big baby scenes. Yeah. And, and uh, I was making a lot of noise. I was probably crying. And, uh, and you silenced me by, by shoving a big binky in my, in my mouth. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, I don't know what got into you that day, but it was like you slugged me in the in in the mouth. I my, my I had this big, huge, fat lip from. Oh my god! I was, I was like, I have no memory of that. Well, that my mouth remembers. I'm god. so sorry. Wow, that must. Well, be. Greg, you, you apologize to the time. There's no hard feelings. I, I just <laughs> I just remember that. That that enormous binky, you know, slamming into my mouth. It's been years of therapy, but you know, we're good. <laughs> I do remember hitting Sean with a snowball when we had that big run around the studio. That that's a yeah, that's one of the ones that's on YouTube. Now we have just heard that Nimoy has left Conakry, so let's pick up the chase. The chase. Ah, ha, ha. Whoa, quite enough of this, Mister. I'll tell you right now. Hey. My daughter loves that one, but it was yeah. good. And when I watched that, my, my main impression is, wow, I could run. Because <laughs> now I can't <laughs> run. But uh, no, that was good. And I'll, um, also, you know, I, I remember it's like some of the stuff we did was, I wouldn't call it athletic, but the four, the, the four or the five of us crammed into the doorway to sing to Greg, sing some of those clues. I don't know how we did that because we, we were all – must three of or two of us must have been on our knees and we were all just kind of squished in there. Trolls are tall as buildings with big heads. They're dumb as dirt and give folks quite a scare. Shoot up, let me tell you now. Bring back that pizza roll body. Whoa, that pizza roll body. Bring them back. Bring back that pizza roll, cause we're getting lonely for some pepperoni. You remember Banks, Banks, Banks? We we had yeah. this where we had to sing the three the three of us. That was, was good. Four, we were, four of us were were like singing some background thing, and the the our lyric was Banks, Banks, Banks. And we we like before the the skit, we said, okay, on Banks, 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 we're all gonna jump, hop on each Banks. And of course, and so like we all got together except for Sean and said like, let's not do it. <laughs> so Sean's is topping things and we're not. Oh my God, it's great. Whoa, thanks, 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 thanks. Whoa. Hey, 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 what? I think we got the point. Thank you. On the final taped episode of Carmen, Sean, you cut off, or Greg, dressed as the barber, you cut off Sean's iconic braids, but... Is it true that nobody else knew what was going to happen? Thank you for calling the braids iconic. <laughs> uh, I look back Instead at them. Instead of problematic. Uh, I look back at them with uh, a mixture of uh, embarrassment and... Uh, ah, it was the you know, 90s. So I spent a lot of money on those. I remember that the only people that knew it was going to happen were Greg and I guess the director and one of the producers. I think maybe I was done with wearing an 80s haircut in the 90s. Ask, have I been swigging too much from the flask? Why cut my braids? You wonder, I've been schmo Derek and Stevie Blunder. It's been 10 years, yeah. Count them at twelve hundred American dollars per annum. I just found uh, almost all of those braids. <laughs> I'm going to be. Uh, tr I'm going to try to sell them. And remember, the Acme Triangle of Excellence. Vigilance, dedication, courage. All geographic information was accurate as of the date this program was recorded. Yeah.
Including all the hair, gentlemen. I mean, I truly loved War in the World as Carmen San Diego. Every element, Greg, Rockapella. So the big question is, why do you change a show? Why do you make a show where in time is Carmen San Diego when the show was already such a huge hit? Tell me where in time is Carmen San Diego. Stop her crime and solve this mystery. I remember somebody, somebody in power telling me it's it's easier to get funding for a new show than to get an existing show refunded. Wow. And, you know, I, don't, I don't know how that works. It was disappointing. I mean, especially in retrospect, <laughs> when you realize now how valuable to a career being on television is. <laughs> um, at the time, maybe, I can't speak for everyone else, but at the time, you know, I remember thinking, oh, you know, We'll we'll get on another TV show or some other amazing thing will happen. But you know these things don't happen very often, and to be on television every day is wow. That's a powerful thing for a career. That sound means it is time for the lightning round. Just like on Carmen San Diego here on Host of Home, we also have oh, a lightning round. Are you guys up for a challenge? Yes, sir. Depends. Oh, yeah. Scott says reluctantly, yes, sir. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to see how well you know your Carmen San Diego crooks. I'm going to go to each of you. I'm going to ask you to name a crook. We're going to keep going until we have one winner. Name any Carmen San Diego crook. Jeff, we're going to start with you. It's a brute. Elliot. Nick the Slick. Barry. Oh. Uh... I lose. <laughs> <laughs> Greg. Eddie Larson. Scott. Top grunge. John. Nee, 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 moi. Nee, 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 moi. That was great, by the way. That was great. Back, back over to you, Jeff. Oh, God. What's left? Um, uh, those two guys, the twins. Yeah. Double Trouble. Yes, Double Trouble. Uh, Elliot. That was the last one I could remember was Double Trouble. You have five left. Oh, I'm my God. Left. Really? Five left? There's five left. Oh, hint, boy. hint, hint. I got one. Three seconds. No idea. No idea. Wonder oh, Rat, but... the fabulous oh. Wonder Rat, <laughs> the mighty Wonder Rat. Hey. All right, there's Scott. There's four more left. I got nothing. All right, I'll give you guys a hint. <laughs> oh. Uh, the Robo Crook. Robo Crook. And the Contessa. Contessa. Yeah. And, and uh, Nana Rap, but people didn't realize that. She was very nefarious. She was. <laughs> she had stuff going on. Wow, double agent. Nobody knew. She's no good. good. You got the Nana. By the way, the two that nobody named, just so we can put everybody out of their misery, um, was Sarah Nade. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sarah Nade. Okay, that was a rock one. Yeah. And then nobody, nobody named Carmen San Diego. Oh. oh. Um, well, we want to talk about what everybody's doing now. Uh, Scott, you have been in Rockapella coming up on 30 years, and you're still making great music with Rockapella. When you hear that statistic that Scott Leonard has been with Rockapella for 30 years, does it surprise you? Yeah, it's kind of surreal. I don't, doesn't really mean anything to me. I'm like, just, <laughs> day after day, just get up and do it again. And then it just accumulates like that, I guess. Crazy. It's, I can't believe it's been 30 years since we did Carmen San Diego. I mean, that that's another life. Yeah. And, and Jeff, you're also still with Rockapella. Can you tell us what the group is up to nowadays? Well, we never stopped uh, making stuff uh, and we've had a lot of albums and, uh, you know, Folgers coffee commercials and all kinds of things like that. So, you know, if that sound is something that you uh, enjoy, please come and check us out.
love with you. Elliot, you left Rockapella in 2004, and I'm really jealous of you because you work on my wife and my absolute like favorite TV show, besides Carmen, of course. Can you tell us about that? Um, I guess you're talking about The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Yeah. Um, but um, so I work on my, I built a business over the years, consulting on and submitting tax incentive applications for many, many, many TV shows and films in New York. Wow. Um, so I work for big studios um, and one of them is, one of, the, one of my shows is The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Wow, it's a fantastic show. How about you, Barry? Huh? How about you? <laughs> what, are, what are you up to? Well, you know, I left the group in 2002 and my, my primary incentive was uh, my kids were growing up without me. Um, so I, I, I spent a good amount of time kind of having a relationship with my kids, which went by really fast, you know, because then, then college happened and out of the house. And, um, I, I retrained as a, as a um, therapist. And I've been doing that for, gosh, 15 years. Uh, but I, I, I still get to do music and I have, I, I, I've been doing voiceovers for since 1983, I think. Um, so I, I'm still basically doing everything that I was doing except singing with the guys and, and traveling. And of course, we have to mention this, how could we forget, you were the announcer of the game show. You would announce- I was. That's right. <laughs> All these people want to know where in the world is Carmen San Diego. And one of these dumb shoes could find her. She's traveled to South Carolina and collects basketball cards. Meet Ashley Parham. He's visited Niagara Falls and has a travel guide collection. Meet Adam Irby. She's been to Spain and Colombia and likes martial arts. Meet Stephanie Donoso. We all wear a lot of hats. Literally, literally wear. Literally. Yeah. Like Elliot, literally wear a lot of hats. Sean, you always wear a lot of hats. And now you have this incredible duo, the Everly set. Wake up, little Susie, wake up. Never felt like this until I kissed you. Love hurts, love scars. I'm in a, <laughs> I'm in a <laughs> Everly Brothers tribute act. I've become one of the, you know, when I was when I was uh, focused on writing original music, I used to laugh at tribute acts. And now I've become, that's what I do now. <laughs> and finally, because the show is called Hosts at Home, oh, the host yes. with the most, Greg Lee in very sunny Santa Monica, California. What are you up to nowadays? Uh, mostly I just do a lot of voiceover like Barry and, um, and then uh, we do a lot of writing. Pitch and I just uh, did a show for Audible for Highlights Magazine. We did a bunch of kids stuff for them. So we still do a lot of that stuff. Well, guys, this has been truly phenomenal to reunite the cast of Where in the World is Carmen Sinego. Did you guys have fun? Yes, I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah, it was a lot it's of great. fun. It's great to see you guys. Very great to see you. Yeah, yeah, that was key. You it's gotta good. count it off, Sean. You gotta give it a shot. Is that it? That's it. Uh, wow, that's so high. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. Let's take it down. Let's take it. Let's take it down a whole step. Oh my god. <laughs> hey, hey. Oh god. It'll, it'll am I really gonna try to do it? Is it'll it never. Do it? It'll never sync up. It'll never sync up. Right. Warning. What you're about to see is living proof that live music does not work over Zoom. One, two, three. Oh yeah, it's probably like a half second off. <laughs> See, I told you. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Thank you all so much for being with us here on Hosts at Home. Thank you, Adam. Like Thanks, every Adam. episode. Thank you, guys. Like every episode, I don't close the show. We're going to go to the host of Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, senior agent in charge of training new recruits. Greg Lee, over to you. Thanks, Adam. This has been a true blast. Thanks to the boys for showing up. Thanks to all of you for showing up. Please be sure to join us again for Host at Home. 
Until then, do it, Rockapella! Well, she sneaks around the world from Vienna to Carolina. She's a sticky finger filcher from Berlin down to Belize. She'll take you for a ride on a slow boat to China. Tell me where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Steal their soul in South Korea. Make it let it come right off the from the Red Sea to Greenland. They'll be singing the blues. This is Lynn Dickpin speaking for where in the world is Carmen San Diego. And remember, we chase crooks down through towns and states. They end up stamping license plates. All geographic information was accurate from the date this reunion was recorded. Is Carmen San Diego.